So we needed better drugs and um, incretins came. Incretins are different drugs. They work on the GI tract. The idea is as soon as we eat, when the food reaches the stomach, the L cell in a duodenum produce a glucagon-like peptide GLP-1. GLP-1 has different functions in the body. It is important to go to the liver and decrease gluconeogenesis, sugar production. It goes to the brain and tell that person that you ate, you don't have to eat as much. It goes to the pancreas by increasing insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent fashion so it does not cause hypoglycemia. It can decrease glucagon secretion also in a glucose-dependent fashion. It's known to help the beta cell in different form, decrease the apoptosis, which is the death of beta cell. It has an effect on the muscles and bone, but also had a main, mainly effect on the stomach by decreasing emptying. So it does all the right signal for the body that you ate, and the GLP-1 should help you stop eating and should help the body prepare to handle that food. So GLP-1 is a normal peptide that our body makes. We found out that type 2 diabetics don't either have enough of it or they have resistance to it. And there's an enzyme, evil enzyme, called DBB4 that blocks and destroys our old GLP-1 and makes it live only for two minutes and 98% of it is destroyed. So if we need to bring that message back, we found out that patients who have diabetes or prediabetes, they have the problem with the hunger, they either want to eat all the time, and they cannot bring the insulin secretion at the right moment when they eat. So in order to bring that sensor, the messenger, the one that tells the body, hey, I'm ready for the food, we had to bring the GLB-1 up. So one way we can do it with blocking DBB-4, and these are the pills, DBB-4 inhibitors, like Genuvia, Anglyza, Trigenta, Nacina, and multiple others, or we can give GLP-1 agonist injection that look like our own GLP-1 except has a peptide, amino acid side where the DBB-4 cannot destroy it. So GLP-1 lasts longer. These two drugs in a way, they're great for the beta cell, preserve the beta cell, no hypoglycemia, no increased risk of hypokalemia. They are good for the heart. I mean, every study done on these drugs, the DBB4s or GLP-1, have showed they're good for the heart. There was a slight increase of heart failure in one of them, saxagliptin, the rest of the medication have been shown in long-term cardiac studies that are good for the heart. Significant reduction of heart uh, disease. They are not the same. So these pills are not as effective uh, as the injections. You gotta know the difference. DBB4 inhibitor can drop A1C by 0.8%. GLP-1 can do it by 1.4, 1.5%. There's weight loss with GLP-1 injections. No weight changes with the DBB4. So you have to know what these drugs will do before deciding which one is gonna work for me. But knowing they do everything right except there's more side effects with the injections because they can cause more GI side effects, the nausea and vomiting that has slowly disappears over time. The last group of drugs that came for diabetes, and so they are different. They work in different part of the body, work on the kidneys. They're called SGLT2 inhibitor, sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors. If we see this graph here, really understand how these drugs work. This is a nephron. We have 400,000 of these nephrons. They are in the kidney. Their job is to uh, accept all the um, electrolytes and sugars and food. They get into these tubules and they reabsorb or secrete it based on the need. The SGLT2 job in the proximal tubule, they reabsorb 90% of the glucose that is coming towards them. 10% are reabsorbed by SGLT1. And that's why we always have glucose-free urine. And we thought that is a good thing. The kidneys are safe from the glucose. And if the glucose reach above 180, it will start coming in the urine. That's a bad sign. Then we've discovered there's a family of 
genetic disorders who have promo SGLT2 and they release glucose into the urine even if they have normal glucose. And we found, well, let's treat these people. What we found out, these are actually healthy, they don't have any problem, no obesity, no diabetes, no heart disease. So it was not a bad mutation to have. And we say, well, let's find out if we block SGLT2s, what happened to the body. So we did that in diabetics, and we found out with these medications, if we filter 180 grams of glucose, 90% of it by taking this drug will be released into the urine. That means every time you eat, half of the glucose is going to end up in the urine, so your kidney helping you get rid of the glucose. There's benefit and risk of this. So these last group drug, the SGLT2s are Involcana, Farsiga, Jardian, Steglatro. They are the trade names that you may be familiar with. They work differently. So they have great impact on the glucose by lowering sugar. They lower A1C by around 1.3, 1.5%. They help us lose weight because the glucose that goes in the urine is 90 grams every day. That's six servings of carbohydrate that translates into the weight loss. When the glucose comes out, the distal tubule, it will take water and sodium with it. So that will give you some diuresis. So you can actually get rid of some fluid. If you have edema, this is a great drug for you. It also takes sodium with it. That will also help you lower the blood pressure. All these are benefits. So also, this will decrease the glucose load on the pancreas and preserve the beta cell. By decreasing blood pressure and the blood sugar, putting less pressure on the kidneys, so the kidneys are happy with these drugs, the opposite of what we think. There's no risk of hypoglycemia because the drug will stop working when the glucose reach around 80 or 90. They only work when the sugars are high. There's no risk of heart disease. The opposite, we see more of the trials that congestive heart failure, heart disease is decreased significantly with these drugs. Now, what are the problem? We can use them in renal failure. So if GFR, measurement of kidney tests, between 45 to 60 percent, you can use them selectively. Less than 45, you cannot use them. If have somebody who already have dehydration or low blood pressure, you cannot use them because they do this. If you have somebody with a problem with potassium or they are on potassium sparing diuretic, you have to adjust it. If you are on a diuretic, you have to adjust the dose to make sure the drugs do not cause high potassium or do not cause hypotension and dehydration. You have to adjust the doses based on that. Still with all the adjustment, there's a risk of infection, UTI, uh, mild, but there's also significant risk of yeast infection. The glucose coming out of the body in men and women can cause yeast infection. Uh, surgery measure you can do to prevent it, but some people have a recurrent episode of these, so we have to stop it. So trying to make it easy for you, if you have type 2 diabetes and you try diet and exercise, work all the things we, call, we talked about, the next step is drugs, medication, unfortunately. You tried metformin. That's the first medication all is prescribed, available, cheap, almost free of side effects, has all the good thing to do for you in terms of the heart, the kidney, the weight, no blow blood sugar. Problem, 40% of people cannot tolerate it because of GI side effects with nausea, vomiting, and bloating. And some people are afraid of using it if they have kidney problem or heart problem, though it can be given unless you have heart failure, stage three or four, or kidney failure, stage three and four. But after that, when the metformin stopped working, and that happened usually within two to three years, what, are, what is the second medication? And we talked about all these options. Sulfonylurea, the old, available, the most commonly used. They lower glucose, very effective, unfortunately, have bad effect on the beta cell, bad effect on the heart, high, low potassium, low blood sugar, weight gain, are all a problem. So then these are not the best option usually for patients. TZDs, the the one that's left now is only pioglitazone. Effective, they lower insulin resistance, but the weight gain, heart failure, edema, effect on the bone, on the bladder, also make these drugs less desirable. We not a drug that we like to use in, in type 2 diabetes. 
DBB4s, the pills, the great, the lower A1C about 0.7.8%, so they're not very powerful drug. They can bring your A1C from 14 to 7, but if you have somebody you want to bring it from 8 to 7 with less side effects and really no effect on the weight, preserving the beta cell, have good effect on the heart so far, these will be good choices. But if you need more powerful drugs in the same family of, of, of GLP-1 analogs, injectables, they can be twice a day, once a day, once a week, you know, hopefully we'll have longer active formulation in the future. What they usually do, not only lower A1C more, but also they're good for the heart. Every study showed that there's reduction of heart disease. They are good for the weight, significant weight loss. Effect on the blood pressure is good. Uh, they also, also don't affect the uh, low glucose or low potassium. The GI side effects, because they slow down the gastric emptying, you may feel some nausea and that dissipate over time. If you can tolerate them, stay on these medications, they work great, especially for weight loss. And the last group of, are the SGLT2s. Like These will help you not only control blood pressure, sugar, bring the A1C down, they can lower blood pressure, they can help edema, they're great for heart failure, they're good for the heart, there's no increased risk of cancer, Preserve, preservation of beta cell uh, is also there, help, helping the kidney function is also there. So they are great choice, but if you already have renal failure, you cannot use these drugs. So you, the choice of second medication after metformin has to be individualized based on what I'm looking for. Do I have kidney problem or not? Do I have to lose weight or not? Do I have high blood pressure or not? Do I have edema or not? Then my decision will be based on these. What is the best medicine for me at that moment? You have to discuss that with your doctor. Come with the best option to get a better treatment in the future. If you only look at an A1C reduction alone without all these extra benefits, you are not helping yourself or helping your patient.